It's my great pleasure to introduce our featured speakers, who are cousins, the daughters of brothers who made significant contributions to the fields of physics and chemistry. Their innovations were of critical importance during World War II. Merle Tuve's discoveries in understanding the ionosphere led to the development of radar technology and the proximity fuse for military weapons. Last week's lecture by Jamie Holmes, author of 12 Seconds of Silence, spotlighted Merle and his team's work on the proximity fuse. Richard Tuve worked to increase the survival rate of military personnel stranded in the ocean and developed firefighting foams for use on planes, ships, and submarines. Lucy Tuve Comley is the daughter of physicist Dr. Merle Tuve and Dr. Winifred Whitman. Lucy is a graduate of Cornell University. Following the family's tradition of higher education, she earned a PhD in cell biology and a master's degree in computer science. After retiring from GE, she has enjoyed traveling, art, gardening, and creative writing. Lucy is joined tonight by her husband, Dr. Jim Comley, who is a retired physicist. Christine Tuve Burris is the daughter of chemist Richard Tuve and Maxine Duvel. She has a master's degree in counseling, but has spent her career in nonprofits. Christine and husband Jim have raised a son, been active in Boy Scouts, and took care of aging parents. Now she says she has a chance to do something exciting and slightly dangerous, glass art. Welcome, and thank you for being here with us this evening to share more about your fathers. Christine, we'll start with you. Would you share a little bit about the Tube family? She's, she's muted. And you're muted, Christine. I will start again. Thank you, Lucy. The two brothers, Merle and Richard, were part of a family of four, all very accomplished in their lives, who grew up in Canton, South Dakota. The photo that you have seen of the four in graduation gowns were the four two siblings receiving honorary degrees from Carleton College in 1961. The four are Richard, the youngest, then Merle, uh, going from the left, Rosemond, and finally George Lewis, too. Their parents, Anthony and Ida, grew up near Decorah, where Festerheim is located. They were children of Norwegian immigrant parents. When Anthony was 25, he accepted a teaching position at the Norwegian Lutheran School of Augustana College. It was located out west in the new state of South Dakota. He soon became president of the struggling school and Ida Larson joined the faculty as the music teacher and then became Anthony Tube's wife. They married in 1893 in Decorah and their firstborn was George Lewis in 1896. In 1901, they moved into their new home there, there it is, and Merle was born that same year. Here's the family somewhat later in 1909 or 10. The children with both parents being teachers were encouraged to learn and to explore things that, were, that they were curious about and to participate in family life, especially music. When George Lewis was 15 in 1911, his parents read about the new organization called Boy Scouts. Some of the Canton boys were into mischief, and this seemed a terrific way to keep young men occupied. Merle, at 10, and he's on the, the third row down, seated on the ground on the left, he begged to join, so he got a custom-sized smaller uniform. Our grandfather, Anthony, was the scoutmaster, and he's there on the left, uh, probably keeping an eye on young Merle. Just months before their fa father suddenly died from pneumonia in 1918, the family gathered in the living room in Canton. George Lewis, who was home from college, took the photo. Note how this is just a normal home with stacks of books on the floor. See them below the table there? And uh, Merle is playing the piano and uh, Roseman is knitting, mom is reading, and uh, Anthony, uh, my grandfather, our grandfather, was reading to Richard. 
The family left Canton after Anthony died, but the town still remembers its famous sons and daughters. This sign was painted two months ago on the side of the Canton Wheel Public House restaurant. Yeah. Merle and his sister Rosemond are included in addition to Merle's childhood friend, fellow physicist, Ernest Lawrence, who developed the cyclotron. Yeah. Merle and Ernest lived across the street from each other in Canton, and together their friendship led to a number of joint projects, including at age 14, they developed a wireless communication from the tube phone to Beloit, Iowa, a distance of about two and a half miles. This without ever having seen a wireless. Now on this picture, um, the man at the bottom of the sea is Ernest Lawrence. And then we have Rosemond. And then I'm not sure, and up near the top is uh, Merle Tube next to uh, our uh, Rovog. Thank you, Christine. Lucy, we'll turn to you next with some questions. Growing up, were you aware of your father's work? Well, first I wanna thank you, Loran, for putting on this exhibit, illustrating some of the many contributions Norwegian Americans have made to our country, but also providing me an opportunity to honor my father. And being aware of my father's work, um, during World War II, of course, I was very young, and I had no idea what science and physicists did, no, no concept. But I, essentially, I knew he traveled, he was late for dinner very often, and he did secret work that had to do with the war. And it wasn't until after the war, when we did a lot of summer travels, uh, doing seismology, that I began to understand about research and being a scientist. Could you tell us about some of Merle's key accomplishments? Uh, that's a big order for my dad. <laughs> his published papers fill several volumes. First, um, his most first notable work was actually his Johns Hopkins Applied Physics, or Johns Hopkins PhD thesis, and that covered studies of the ionosphere. His work, which was using the pulse technique, showed the existence of the theoretically predicted Kennelly heaviside layer as an explanation of the skip distance, as is called, in the effect of radio waves. Reviewers note that Dad was the first to exploit pulse echo method and that he should be recognized as a pioneer for the subsequent development of radar. <clears throat> in the 1930s, and I think we have a slide, yes, we do, that's the Van de Graaff machine. Um, there are well, in this photo, I think that's Uddal and my father down on the floor. Ud was a Norwegian. He was um, in, in a pilot and ran expeditions. And he was also a technician, could build equipment. Um, he is Norwegian. He went back to Norway in 1936. I don't know if you have another picture, but Larry Hafstead was part of the crew too, where they worked with the Van de Graaff machine. So we had all Norwegians. Larry was born of immigrant Norwegian parents. Um, they focused on nuclear physics. And um, in that case, the Van de Graaff machine was now, which is now in the Smithsonian collection, was used to generate very high energy, which produced the force that known as, they could study the force known as the proton-proton interaction in the nucleus. <clears throat> His work was recognized as a major contribution by theoretical physicists of that period. Later on during World War II, as you heard in Jamie Holmes' presentation last week on his wonderful book, 12 Seconds of Silence, Dad led the development of the proximity fuse, which was used in the defense of London against the German buzz bombs, and also in the Battle of the Bulge and in defense of the Pacific Fleet against the Japanese. It is still used today, of course, in the Iron Dome in Israel, the, or, or a version of it. The development operation known as Section T for two became the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. Dad was the first director, and there he is. And in his youth, I would say, I remember him as much older. The administration building is named for him at Hopkins. And that is probably a picture taken, I don't know exactly when, it could have been actually at the Applied Physics Lab, but in 46, he became the director of the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism of the Carnegie Institution of Washington. 
And that gave him an opportunity. I'm sure this was just a rich opportunity for him <clears throat> to foster and participate in a very broad range of research. For example, we spent a number of summers between 1946 and 1955 traveling the US, Canada, and Alaska doing seismological studies. He called it studying the roots of mountains. This was before and during much of the continental drift analysis work. Leftover munitions from World War II and his work under Section T and his uh, Navy connections provided the explosive materials for the research. I helped him set up seismometers and the radio antennas for a number of these trips. He supported biophysics research at DTM. I also did uh, publish research there with his biophysics staff one summer after college. He got himself involved in radio astronomy, studying the hydrogen clouds in our galaxy, including doing that work after his retirement. Our exhibition at Vesterheim is entitled Innovators and Inventors. Did your father consider himself an inventor or an innovator or something else? Well, I hope you have that slide of him where he's kneeling down. There he is. I don't know the exact age, but maybe 12. Don't know exactly what he's playing with, but he was always an experimenter. So though he never talked about being an innovator or an inventor, I would say that for sure a scientist <clears throat> is an innovator. They help discover new things that disproved, contribute to the future development of radar, in dad's case, and the, also the understanding of atomic forces, the use of pr proximity weapons, and the roots or structure of mountains. How would he want to be remembered and how would you like for him to be remembered? Well, maybe you can show me the family photo too that Christine, there we are earlier on. That is unfortunately without Richard. He hadn't been born yet. But, you know, that's a classic of 1910, 1912. Very upright. Both parents being teachers probably knew a great deal about discipline, which I'm sure my father needed at his age. But it was also um, a very moralistic family. They, it was a strict Lutheran upbringing. My father used to be very appalled when I was playing uh, cards like Go Fish. He, it was not allowed in his family. Um, Dad was a very moral person concerned about humankind. In his later years, he expressed a great deal of remorse about the fuse development. As he said, I have always felt that I drove the lab personnel too hard that I was too harsh. So that's part of his moral upbringing. But he was also a person of drive and huge intellectual curiosity, unlike anyone I have ever known. For example, one, one college summer, I had to study organic chemistry at, at a local college, and he joined me. He took all the lectures and studied the notes because he wanted to know more about what his biophysics group was, was doing. He was a wonderful father. He taught me how to ride a bike, how to ice skate, how to drive a car. He showed me pond water life under a microscope. He tried to help me not be too afraid of lightning. How He showed me how to save money. He took me to church. He got me into photography and music and gave me a great love of geology. He's a lover. He was a lover of nature. He loved geology. I, in fact, have his early college geology books. He planted dwarf fruit trees and azaleas in our backyard. He very much wanted a greenhouse. He, brought, he bought a farm, but he also enjoyed philosophy, particularly dealing with religion, and he loved music. And I think of other things, he, he is certainly known by other people for his aphorisms. I don't want any damn fool in this laboratory to save money. I want him to save time. This was instructions to his staff in section T. Another was shoot for an 80% job. We can't afford perfection. Don't try for an A in a war. D is necessary and sufficient, but an F is fatal. Don't forget that most, the most perfect job is a total failure if it is turned in too late. And I do remember when I was a kind of morose teenager, my father would always tell me, always remember there's sunshine on the other side of the clouds. Nice. <laughs> Wow. Thank you, Lucy. I'm going to ask Christine, uh, you the very same questions about your father, Richard Tooth. All right. Well, that, that was really interesting, Lucy. And I, I think I will add to the end of your talk to say that 
One of my favorite things that Uncle Merle said was um, when he was our age, so older, he, he said, well, it looks the same from in here. Meaning when you're young, you, the world looks a certain way and it looks the same even when you're older. So I think of that often, actually. So thank you so much uh, to you, Loran, for uh, finding uh, my dad and to Westerheim for um, both not only identifying my father, but 50 other Norwegian American inventors and innovators. I know that my dad would be just tickled pink, he would have said. He thought of himself as a scientist and yes, an inventor or innovator too. He was probably an innovator rather than an inventor. He was very proud of his Norwegian heritage and of his being from Canton, South Dakota, even though he moved to DC with his mother in 1926 at age 15. In fact, he and his siblings spent their summers at their maternal grandparents' home in Ridgeway, Iowa, 12 miles west of Decorah. And behind me is uh, the Norwegian flag, which um, uh, has I, my husband and I use for our wedding and we fly it regularly um, at our summer home. There's a wonderful story um, about older brother Merle and baby Richard in the book about the proximity fuse, 12 seconds of silence, that happened about 1915 when Merle was 14 and Richard was just two. I quote, Merle found his brother Richard in the snow, frostbitten. To avoid warming the two-year-old too quickly, he soaked the infant in cold water before placing him in the oven. Richard was not overcooked. So here's a picture of that oven about three years later when Richard was five, maybe six. And notice the cookies behind him. He's, he's avoiding the cookies. We're just watching his mom. Richard was not the intellectual powerhouse of the, his older brother, Merle, but he certainly was someone who used his education and brains to make the most of his intellectual curiosity. When his father suddenly died in 1918, his mother moved with Richard to Minneapolis so that the older three children could attend the University of Minnesota and share living costs. Richard later wrote about his interest in science. Quote, in high school, I developed a strong interest towards scientific experimentation. I had been close to my oldest brother's teaching in mechanical engineering at the University of Minnesota, and later watched the experimental beginnings of radar and high voltage physics of Brother Merle in Washington. When he was old enough to help with family expenses, he found small jobs. He was curious, like Merle had been, though I don't remember any stories of him blowing a hole in the floor with different chemicals. He did want to own a car, and that required a lot of tinkering on a used car that he could afford. Here he is, a photo of him with his then girlfriend with one of the cars in about 1930 and a different car the following year. His mother interested in, in absolutely insisted on college and Merle helped by providing him with a room in his home. The part-time jobs such as being a soda jerk or pallbearer continued and so did his tinkering. The Westerheim exhibit includes this photo of my dad at about age 28 or 30. By then he had graduated from college and was taking graduate courses, was married and had a young son. My brother said of our father, the family was always interested in so many things that he passed along a curiosity of the world. Learning was so important to us. They, that is our father and his brothers, Burl and Lou and sister Roseman, taught us that life is just a series of puzzles. Perhaps those who were zooming far from Decorah would appreciate a few exhibit photos. This is the outside of this beautiful museum with my father in the poster at the far left. Inside on the third floor, the exhibit is entered past the turquoise banner and note how large the room is with all of the inventors, both men and women. Each inventor selected has a poster written about their inventions. And here's Merle Toops 
with the proximity views there, um, uh, followed by Richards. Giving appreciation runs in the family. I was able to find actual concrete examples of my dad's work, and these were presented in an acrylic display case at Vesterheim. My father worked for 32 years as a civilian chemist for the U.S. Navy's Naval Research Lab here in Washington, D.C. During World War II, his team developed the chemical sea dye marker. Its purpose was to color the ocean water to have identified downed pilots for rescue. It is a fluorescent green dye which floats on the surface of the water and is known to have saved at least 157 lives. It was attached to the first astronauts uh, flight suits during the Apollo missions. And today you can purchase one on Amazon. Next, his team was asked to address the problem, which was partially psychological, of a shark attack when in tropical waters. They found that copper acetate did repel sharks, but was not particularly effective when the sharks were in a large group. Thinking about squid or octopus, that's squirt ink, the team decided to try adding a very dark dye to the copper acetate. This combination did provide some protection and certainly it gave moral support to servicemen in the water. Today, scientists continue to address the problem of sharks biting humans. Beginning in the 1950s, we owned a beach cottage on the Chesapeake Bay where we fly this uh, Norwegian flag. It was not heated in winter, so all of the sinks and water pipes had to be drained each fall. He devised a kitchen sink trap to assist with this labor intensive task. And my dad had an artistic side, a common trait of inventors who must think outside the box. In the 1950s, he took classes to learn the hobby of enameling. This is an example of his artistic side. Here he has imagined the USS Nautilus launched in 1954. Finally, the nozzle at the back of the display is an example of one of the early delivery techniques for putting out difficult fires, such as gasoline fires. Water is not effective with a hydrocarbon fire and can even spread the fire. Over a dozen or so years, he and his team experimented with various agents to put out this type of fire. This was critical with gasoline fires as they tend to spread on board an aircraft carrier or at an airport. He patented foams and various chemical combinations uh, most designed to suffocate the fire. He patented, he patented them, um, uh, one which was called the purple K powder because it contained potassium whose chemical symbol is K and the product turned purple when it was applied. The second he called light water because the material floated across and on top of the gasoline and did not sink, resulting in a threefold efficiency in fuel fire extinguishment. Here he is demonstrating, there he is on the right hand side, next, with his leaning against the red fire truck there. Uh, he's explaining all this to the Navy brass. When he retired in 1970, he worked as a consultant and then decided that he wanted to write a book about fire and the chemistry of fire. He wrote Principles of Fire Protection Chemistry and taught several classes at the community college. In the prologue, he tells the student, this text has been planned as an aid to help further the technical and chemical knowledge of the specialist in the field of fire science by presenting the principles of fire protection chemistry. It was used in classrooms for over 25 years after its publication in 1976. The last photo is he and mom married nearly 50 years. She was also the typist for this book completed at their kitchen table in Silver Spring, Maryland. I remember him knowing so many things and being unafraid to open up a toy or electrical socket to find out what was wrong. He had a workbench with various screws, parts of things, and just junk. He would take the item downstairs, fish about in all these things, and come back with a working gadget. 
he would install outdoor lights and wire them to be turned on inside the house. We had spigots throughout our yard as he dug up his lawn, put in hose below it, below the lawn, and installed spigots where he wanted them. Oh, it, don't all dads do this? Isn't this normal for a dad? What makes an inventor? Curiosity? Lack of money for the new thing? Which is, of course, an incentive to repair the old one. Maybe parental encouragement to use one's natural instincts to explore. Perhaps it is only the joy of figuring out the puzzle, trying various solutions, and finally achieving a result. My dad was an innovator, not just of chemical combinations and reactions, but of the mechanical way to package and deliver the chemicals for the desired result. That is more than just academic study, but adaptation to real world usage. He would want to be remembered for making a contribution to his family, his community, and to the larger scientific knowledge. He was most proud of using his abilities to save lives and to advance the field of fire science. For myself, I want him to be remembered for using the resources at hand or provided by the US Navy to solve identified problems. He was not a dreamer, but a doer. He taught me to try to understand the gadget and then to make a repair. I feel his influence every day. Thank you, Christine. Amen. Your father's legacies are somewhat bittersweet. Uh, while Merle's proximity fuse ultimately saved lives, it cost lives too, Lucy. I would I certainly agree with that. I think dad felt very badly for many, many years about the Second World War. He was indeed determined to save the British lives against the German buzz bombs but he was absolutely devastated and did not approve of the use of the proximity fuse to kill hundreds in the Battle of the Bulge battlefield and in some other battles. And as he said, with remorse, I made so many orphans. It was bittersweet. Could you comment on the bittersweet legacy too, Christine? Some of Richard's life-saving chemicals have now been found to cause cancer. Well, the development of innovations in science, uh, it's not a straight line. Um, some of what my dad invented has been proven to be ineffective or to have other characteristics, as you, as you mentioned, problems with breakdown in the environment and even with human disease from small, very small particles inhaled or dissolved in water. My father would be so disappointed and upset had he lived to see these changes. Yet his legacy of learning about fire and how to stop it using chemical means does continue. Young scientists are trying new ways to stop fire, building on the innovation of my dad and his colleagues. You both mentioned just a little bit about your father's appreciations for their Norwegian heritage, but I wondered if you could say a few more words. Lucy, would you like to start? I can try that. Um, basically, he was very proud of it. If I can show you something that I found today. Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, can you see this at all? Yes. It looks like some rose mauling. <laughs> yes. And, and, and it is a beautiful inscription, a beautiful painting on the inside. And in any case, that was a gift to me in 1947 by one of his Norwegian, the wife of one of his Norwegian friends that he'd worked with during, I guess it was uh, before the war, but even during the war. Um, but, you know, in point of fact, he taught us to, how to say Tuzentak, but he, um, his life was very busy. After his father died, when he was only 18, I think life became very, very real for him. And he was forever after busy, very busy. So we didn't really visit any relatives in the Midwest. Um, I don't have any connections to them at all but he was proud of his Norwegian heritage. I'm sure of that. And Christine? Well, I, I think um, our, uh, our uncle Lou, the George Lewis, the, the oldest and firstborn was really um, uh, uh, wonderful uh, in, in his retirement. He went out and tried to find all the people who were related to us. And, 
it turned out that he found over 500. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, a lot of those people had names like, you know, Burris and Comley. And mm -hmm. so they didn't have names like Tooth. Um, my father actually had looked for years in the, in the phone book. Every new city he went to, he would look to see if there were any tubes. And after years of doing this, he finally found one in uh, San Diego, John Tube, who um, turned out actually to be a relative. And um, so we in enjoyed uh, not only Uncle Lou's work, but also um, uh, this, this gentleman who came to Washington and the both Merle and Richard got to meet him. Fun. We heard a little bit about Richard's hobby of enameling. Lucy, did your father, Merle, have hobbies or interests outside of work or after retirement? Well, I wouldn't say he had time for hobbies when he was working, but um, he basically definitely had hobbies when he retired, not the least of which he, st he stayed with the radio astronomy from his lab, but carrying on the radio tradition he started when he was, what, 14? Um, he, he and my son had ham radio connections. We live in Schenectady. Dad was in Washington, D.C. And when my son was in his early teens and wanted to do ham radio, my father decided he, by golly, was going to communicate with his grandson. And they had a good time communicating back and forth as best the radio waves would let them. But dad had a lifetime interest in photography. I think he gave it over to me, too. He loved music. His, as I mentioned, he liked plants, and he, although very quiet about it, was a devoutly religious person, I believe, and he was very interested in philosophy, which he read a lot of, and he shared with me on occasion, but he had many hobbies. He was never bored with, with life. <laughs> well, well, Lucy, well, one, of your, uh, one of your dad's later hobbies was computers, and I'm sure you remember in the 70s before any of us had computers uh, uh my dad and mom and i i'm not sure who all else what went to visit uncle merle and aunt winifred and wouldn't you know but he got to talking about computers and my father afterwards was like what is merle doing with computers what's that <laughs> all about <laughs> <laughs> Well, we, I think we inherited his first an old computer. It was one of our first that we had, too. And we moved on from that. But that was in the 1980s, I think. Well, you know, he died in 82. So uh, it was at that time we acquired it. Lucy, would you share a few of your father's honors? I would be delighted to do that. You know, he was very fortunate in his lifetime that he was recognized. All his work was recognized. And after the war and the proximity fuse development, he received the Medal of Merit from President Truman. And he was also named an honorary commander in the Order of the British Empire. He received the John Scott Award of the City of Philadelphia. He served on the President's Advisory Council. And he was also Home Secretary of the National Academy of Sciences. He was the first director, as I've noted, of the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. He then for 20 years was director of Carnegie's Department of Terrestrial Magnetism. He received beyond his PhD an honorary doctor of science from Hopkins, which was among seven honorary degrees that he received. And he was one, of course, all four of them received honorary degrees from Carleton College. Smart family. Now, uh, we're going to put Jim on the hot seat now. He's been watching and listening. And so, uh, Jim Cumley, I have a question for you as a physicist. How did it feel to marry into a family that some might consider scientific royalty? <laughs> you know, I only found out about the scientific royalty part of that years later when I appreciated it. Lucy and I met in college, were married September after we graduated from undergraduate school. And uh, I, we had some interesting interactions with them. Merle was always very kind and very uh, interested and interesting to his uh, budding physicist <laughs> potential son-in-law. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he just 
when I really found out what he was like, I, I was amazed by the things that he had done. Uh, I have one story though about our interaction with him. We, we went out to visit the family before we were married to tell them that we were engaged and that we were gonna get married in the fall, which made everybody's jaws drop. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in setting up for a little engagement party that they gave, uh, he was, I remember he was bringing some flowers out of the kitchen into the dining room to set them on the table there. And I was going in, I walked past him and he stopped right in the middle of the, of the doorway and said, Mr. Comley, he'd been calling me Jim up till that time. <laughs> I believe you <laughs> came with a question for me. <laughs> and I said, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't really ask him for permission because we'd already decided we were going to get married. So I managed to blurt out something like, uh, uh, your daughter and I are in love. We are planning to get married and we would very much appreciate having your uh, approval. And he said, you have that approval. You're a fine fellow and I'm glad to have you coming in the family. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. It's such a wonderful opportunity for us all to get a better sense of these scientists as real people. Uh, I know, Lucy, you had a wonderful memory of traveling with your father that you wanted to share with us. Well, I'm, I'm at a loss for which, which memory, but I know, you know, we traveled from 1946 to 1955 uh, in the summer and probably on the order of about six times in there. Um, <laughs> with scientific teams. With scientific teams. We were not alone. We were in our own family car because my brother was along. Uh, I think on one of the trips, maybe two, my mother was able to come along, but of course she was working. She was a psychoanalyst. Um, but I'm not sure what story you're referring to because I, you know, living with him was a story in itself. <laughs> driving, up, driving up the Alcan Highway. Oh, well, the Alcan Highway was, was an experience in itself that was going to Alaska. And uh, I, this was when I, just before I went to college, and of course, I had a driver's permit at that time, and we all took turns driving. And I actually had the phenomenal experience of having hallucinations. I literally saw a zebra beside the road, <laughs> and then later it was a tiger. And at that point, my father decided to take over the driving. <laughs> <laughs> and how about you, Christine? Uh, is there another memory that you'd like to share with us about your father, Richard? Oh, gosh. Well, he, he always is uh, at this beach place. Um, even all these years later, um, he died in 1995. And yet um, we still uncover things that he, well, uh, buried in the ground or got <laughs> covered over by water somehow. And we, this just this past weekend, we were installing an air conditioning uh, a window air conditioner and the gentleman installing it needed a, a, a hole on the side and I looked al along the wood edge and said oh well there's a hole and so it had a <laughs> it had a, a corkscrew yeah a corkscrew in it uh, not a screw a cork a cork a, a wine bottle cork in the hole so mm -hmm. the gentleman pulled it out and he looked at it and he said Oh my gosh, that's a that's a cork. And I said, no, that's my dad for you. You know, you know, one of the things I remember about your father and also about mine, I remember your dad was a very funny guy. Um, my father somehow didn't have a sense of humor. He, he he never understood the jokes that my brother and I or my mother would would be laughing our heads off at. But your father one night, I remember we were all sitting quietly. It was a Sunday afternoon, I guess sitting quietly in the living room and then heard a fire engine siren. And it turned out when we went to the front door, there was your father and your brother. <laughs> I don't know if you were there, but he had on one of these children's fire engine hats, which when you push the button, it sounded just like a fire <laughs> engine. That was a classic thing on his part. Yeah. He was yeah, the life of the classic. party. Yeah. He was always funny. He, 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 he understood good humor and I wish my father had, but it was wonderful in that sense, your dad. I had a uh, I, I had a, an interesting sort of intersection with uh, Richard, not actually with him, but with his reputation. 
For a number of years, I was involved in visiting committees at the National Institute of Science and Technology, Standards and Technology, Solid, originally the National Bureau of Standards. And at one point I was chairing a committee that was dealing with uh, fighting fire, <clears throat> uh, modeling firefights and, uh, and uh, protecting against fire. And when I mentioned Tuve, they said, oh, do you know Richard Tuve? Yeah. <laughs> well, he was, oh my gosh, that's wonderful. It says it, to meet somebody who's actually met him and knows him is really astonishing. So he made quite a, quite a swell in that field. Very well reputed. Wonderful. It was a wonderful family. Yep. Yes, exactly. You know, I, I, I hope I'm not interfering with the, the main story here, but there were four siblings. Three of them were scientists or engineers. Rosamond mm -hmm. was a student and a professor of medieval English. English. Was that it? Yes. Yep. And how she got along, because she was probably the only girl in the family, so mm -hmm. she did something different from doing science. Maybe that was it. But she was a very interesting person, too. Lucy you know, may have some stories about her. Uh, well, not too many, but uh, I know she was close to Christine's family. Um, because I, th I think um, Uncle Dick and my father all helped to keep their mother comfortable when she was moved to Washington. And um, Rosamond was, was cl perhaps closer to Dick, um, but she was, a, I heard her lecture at Cornell and I could not understand a word of it. <laughs> it, it was so dense, but she was very, very well known in her field. And I could honestly believe that having the parents they had all of those children were encouraged to follow the thing that really most interested them. They, and they helped develop their interests all along. It was, it was amazing. I wish all parents were like that. <laughs> we had a question uh, last week when Jamie Holmes was speaking about women in scientific careers. Mm -hmm. Did your fathers have any women on their research teams or as coworkers? Uh, golly, no, not, well, dad had at uh, DTM, um, what was uh, Vera Rubin, who was a very, very well-known astronomer. Right. Um, so he supported women, uh, very definitely, he supported women doing research and being in science. The proximity fuse, of course, was during the Second World War, and women um, were not as prominent in independent positions but they were very much part of the team. Um, he, I met a number of them, uh, even as a young, very young person. So they were part of the team, but um, they were not scientists, if you will, outstanding, well-known, but he was a big supporter of women in science, women being independent. I have to testify that his Encouraging women to be independent went over to his daughter quite seriously. <laughs> oh, dear. Not at all. It's wonderful. Christine, how about you? Do you know about your father and his female co-workers? I don't really know. Um, we, you know, he worked all those years at the um, Naval Research Lab. And the Naval Research Lab is actually a closed place you have to have a, a, a badge to go in there. <laughs> and so only once a year were people allowed to go in. I think I only was in his office like twice. Um, and I know he depended on uh, women in, in uh, supporting roles, but I don't know that he had any women in um, as actual co-workers. It was a different age. You know, life has changed yeah. considerably yeah. since then. Yeah. So, so for people of the modern age, I think they were both pretty advanced in their thinking yep. about independent women. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we can take one more question. Were there any inventions that your fathers worked on that never came to fruition? <laughs> Don't think of anything. I can't think of a thing. I'm sure there were. So, uh, uh... Here's a chance to make my comment about inventing versus innovating. Yes, please. Inventing is coming up with an idea and showing that it works. You have to do that to patent it. 
An innovator is somebody who comes up with one idea and another idea and another idea and puts them all together and makes something that works and that influences the world as you go on into the future. Murrow was definitely an innovator. Everything he did that we've heard about are things that led to uh, uh, major understandings of physics and geophysics and that sort of stuff. But I'm sure that, I know in fact from the stories that Lucy and I have both been reading about the proximity fuse that they invented a whole bunch of different ways of making a proximity fuse and almost none of them ended up being useful, as useful as the, the technique they finally engineered and, and worked out. So sure, there are lots of things he invented that didn't turn out to be anything, but they were completely blown away by the innovations that he made in the things that uh, went on uh, after they did their work. Well, what a delightful evening to get to talk to the three of you. Uh, I could go on for hours, but unfortunately we have just a short time tonight. So I'm going to turn it back over to my colleague, Diane, and uh, she'll share some announcements with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Loran, and thank you to Lucy and Jim and Christine. Um, thank you for sending in your questions. And I want to echo, I just thought it was a delightful evening. I loved hearing the stories. Um, you think of scientists as being people who are so very, very smart. And to hear the personal side of it just brought it to life. So thank you very, very much. I'd also like to once again thank the Thompson Family Foundation, who helped us to bring this lecture series and exhibit to Vesterheim and remind everyone that the innovators and inventors uh, exhibit is on view at the museum through May 30th of 2022.